Hi everyone, I'm Lim Tian. Uh, thank you all for watching this video. I'm here today to speak about my father who passed away very recently and uh, my impressions and my memories of him. Well, you know, it's a little known fact that uh, my father was actually an establishment figure. He, he held a quite important position, uh, you know, um, in his life. Uh, I never spoke about it um, when he was alive, but now that he's passed on and uh, it has been revealed in the media who he was, I thought it appropriate that today I speak a little bit about my father and uh, how being his son has uh, influenced me, my upbringing and um, my career so far and the political views I hold today. Yes, it, it, it is true that he was very much an establishment figure. During his uh, career in the government service, he held many jobs in uh, different government departments, culminating in uh, him being the chief executive director of the People's Association, which is a very, very important organization and um, linked to the PAP. So before I go into my father's uh, life and career, I want first of all to talk about him as a father and as a little boy. Uh, he always appeared quite foreboding to me. He was a disciplinarian, but he had a very kind heart. And I remember on many Sundays, he would put on his batik shirt and in the afternoon, take me down to the local coffee shop. And we were living in Serangoon Gardens in those days. And he would order his coffee, he would order his beer, read his Chinese newspapers, and I would have fish bowls. But it would have been impossible uh, to have lived in my household without politics being discussed over the dinner table because that's what happened every night and um, you know it came very naturally I had parents who were naturally interested in politics and the jobs my father held always involved politics when we lived when we lived in Russia where he was a diplomat and uh, the first secretary in the Singapore embassy you must remember that that was in the early 70s and we were at the height of the Cold War. So my parents naturally discussed geopolitical tensions and to me, now thinking back, the names of Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, Brezhnev, Gromyko, Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai were as familiar to me then as the entertainment stars would be familiar to um, little young boys and little young girls today. My father had a tremendous regard for Richard Nixon, the American president. Now many of you would think why? Because Nixon was the disgraced president over Watergate and the first president to have resigned his office. But my father saw him as a person of huge intelligence who understood the geopolitical forces at play and who made an incredible breakthrough into China in 1974 with Kissinger. And the other person my father actually admired hugely was the Chinese Foreign Minister Zhou Enlai. And he spent many hours talking to my mother about Zhou Enlai. I couldn't help but overhear their conversations. And he always thought of Zhou Enlai as this very urbane uh, statesman, but someone who was able to control Mao, you know, because Mao, you must know, was the founder of modern China. And he was a tyrant, he was a dictator. But Zhou Enlai was able to balance the moderate forces against the tyrannical forces that Mao had always aligned. And coming nearer home, when my father was chief executive director of the People's Association, one person he worked, I would say, quite closely with was Lee Kuan Yew, who at that time was the chairman of the People's Association. Now, all of you must know that the chairman of the People's Association is always the Prime Minister of Singapore, uh, as far as the PAP are concerned. And in my father's days, uh, the deputy chairman was another very established PAP minister, Lee Kun Choi, who also had been Singapore's ambassador to Indonesia. My father was a huge admirer of Lee Kuan Yew. He thought of Lee Kuan Yew as really a man of action. And he always admired Lee Kuan Yew's mastery of the English language and told me to learn from Lee Kuan Yew the way he spoke English 
And he thought Lee Kuan Yew just had a fabulous vocabulary and could always find the right word for every occasion. But he did not always agree with Lee Kuan Yew's methods. For example, my father was a thoroughbred Chinese educated gentleman. And he, he and my mother and people of that generation were furious when the government closed down Nanta University where they had graduated. And so I can still remember that as a very distinct point of departure. But at the same time, my father, despite being an establishment figure, had a rebellious streak in him. And he was a great admirer of J.B. Jayaratnam as well. And he thought J.B. Jayaratnam was fantastic. And I can still remember him mimicking very often the way J.B. Jayaratnam would thunder. This is scandalous, the way he bellowed in Parliament when he berated the PAP ministers and parliamentarians. So I, I remember that very, very fondly. And um, it is something I never tire of telling my good friend Kenneth J. Ratnam. You know, one, one, one example I, I, I can tell you of how the PA is a political organization is this. I still recall back in 1981, and my father was the chief executive director of the People's Association then. And that was the year when J.B. J. Ratnam made the historic breakthrough in Anson in the by-election, which he won. And this was after 13 years, 13 years of one-party rule, because as you know, in 1968, the Barisan Socialists walked out of parliament. And thereafter, from 1968 to 1981, the PAP was the only party in parliament. Now, when the Anson by-election was called, the PAP expected to win very handily, very handsomely. But four days out of the elections, my father told Lee Kuan Yew that the ground was moving against the PAP. But Lee Kuan Yew told my father, he had heard from his grassroots, that they were going to win big, somewhere in the region of 75 to 80 percent. But on election night, we know what happened. History was made. J.B. Jayaratnam became the first opposition member of parliament in 13 years. And that shows you, doesn't it, that very often your own party grassroots are not able to tell you the truth. But the PA will always know what the truth is. And this is my personal experience, and this is what I have grown up always thinking of the People's Association. And uh, again, this, I never tire of telling Kenneth Jayaratnam this story. <laughs> I think um, the best way I can explain who my father was is to explain a little bit about his history. And it is actually an extraordinary story, which I do not have to embellish to make it even more remarkable. My father actually was born in Alosta, in Kedah, Malaysia. His parents had come to Malaysia from China. They had had their first son in China, and after that, they came over to Malaysia to seek a better life. And over in Malaysia, my father, being the second child in the family, together with my third uncle, my father was a second, my third uncle, my fourth uncle, and his sisters, my aunties, my two aunties were born. And you would have thought, well, he would have grown up as a Malaysian. No, that did not happen, because my grandfather had a very aged and a very frail mother back in China. And just to show you how filial children were in those days, he sent my grandmother together with her brood of children, except for the eldest son, who remained back in Malaysia, back to China to stay with his aged and frail mother. And then my father grew up in China until the age of 12. And he was about to go off to a very famous school in Fujian province on an island called Gulangi, which is a very beautiful island. I have visited it, and many of you would have visited it as well. It is an island where no cars are allowed. 
and where very often if you walk through the streets during the day, you will hear music wafting through the air because there are many famous uh, musical observatories there and schools. So very pretty place. My father was about to go to school there, but that was 1948, 1949. And uh, civil war in China between the Kuomintang led by Chiang Kai-shek and the communists led by Mao Zedong was raging. And they had closed in on Xiamen. And Xiamen, is, as you know, is the provincial capital of Fujian province. And literally, and this I heard from my uncle, literally on the very last boat out of Xiamen, my grandfather took my father, being the eldest one in China, out of China. And they went back to Alostar in Malaysia. And I sometimes think, if that had not happened, I would not be where I am today. And certainly my family would not be where they are today. And so back in Malaysia, back in Alosta, he grew up. He was always a prodigious student. And I always remember him telling me and my family how good he was in school. He always boasted that he came in number one. And so he then went to Penang to study in a very famous Chinese school called Chongling High School. And after Chongling High School, he came down to Singapore for his university, where he studied in Nanta University, and there he met my mother. And after finishing their studies, they married and had their family. But throughout his life, he maintained a very close association with two institutions. That was Chongling High School, his school in Penang, and Nanta University. And he would always go to their reunions every year. So my father came from a very humble background. And that was reflected in his adult life. He hated elitism. Even though he was part of the establishment, he disdained the country club set. You know, when he was chief executive director of the People's Association, we were members of the Singapore Island Country Club. And he got that membership by virtue of his position, his seniority in the civil service. I cannot remember him stepping into the club more than three occasions, on three occasions, to have the meal with us. He thought it was absurd and crazy that Singapore, being such a small island, had in those days over 20 golf courses. He thought, what a waste, and that land could have been used for more productive means could have been used to build houses for people and all that. While years later, I developed a, a love for golf. I do not know what he thought about it, but I certainly share his sentiments as far as too much land usage for golf courses. And I was telling you earlier that on Sundays, he would take me down to the coffee shop. He would order his coffee. He would order his beer. And that, that is how he liked it. He, he was a man who was very comfortable in his own skin. He never put on airs. And he may have eaten at the table and drank at the parties of the establishment, but in a strict sense, he was not part of the establishment. And he had the strength and the independence to always be able to look in from the outside. And he never belonged to any clique, any group, or any club. And so I, I greatly admire, I greatly admire this strength and this independence of his, which took him all the way from his humble beginnings in Alosta, all the way to the top of the civil service. And I, I think that, that, that is, you know, um, the best thing I remember about my father. I, I think my father's example is a, is a great lesson to all the young people out there because it shows you that with courage, with sheer determination and with ambition, you can reach the very top, no matter how, no matter where you originated from. And I always learned from my father uh, a brilliant saying from a very famous American lawyer called Daniel Webster, who said, don't ever let people tell you how crowded the field is, because there's always space at the top. So we should all 
aspire and strive to reach the very top of what we are able to achieve. And I like to remember, how, how, how would I like to remember my father and what he has imparted to me? I think he taught me the value of independent thought, never to go with the crowd. That is why I set up my own political party and my father never once objected to me setting up my own political party. I would like to think that he was proud in what I did. And uh, certainly he would have agreed with uh, the positions I have taken as a politician. I know my father watched my videos, he listened to my speeches, and uh, yes, he was very proud of, of what I was doing. He was someone who had absolutely no time for a person who had no courage and who preferred to toe the line, just for the sake of comfort and safety. And I still recall how he told me the story of the time in the 70s when, as part of an official delegation, he visited the House of Commons and they were in the Strangers Gallery. And there was a huge debate going on. And that was the first time he said he saw Margaret Thatcher, who at that time was leader of the opposition. And he was so impressed by her. And he came back and he said she was just brilliant. And um, so, so that was my father. He, he, he appreciated both sides of the debate. And um, I think he would have thought lesser of me if I had tried to ride on his coattails, to go into the establishment, be part of the establishment. Um, I never wanted to do that. I, I'm happy, I'm glad for that. Maybe I inherited my father's rebellious streak and he had a very strong rebellious streak, as many of his colleagues, you know, will, will tell you. And um, yeah, that, that is another very, very fond memory I have of him. And I think it has shaped my politics and it has shaped who I am today. And finally, to wrap up, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who has sent me messages of condolences, sent flowers to the wake, I was very touched. I was very touched by all the members of PV who came in droves to comfort me as I battled my grief. I was very touched when uh, Josephine Teo and the other members of parliament for Jalan Besar sent flowers as well. I think that's a great example, isn't it, of how political opponents can battle on the political battlefield, but ultimately, we are still humans. And when any calamity, when any grief besets us, you know, a fellow human being can comfort us. So I thank you all. I thank all my friends. I thank Terry Su and Leong Zi Hien, the people I represented recently in the defamation actions for coming. I thank Ji Se, Kin Lian, Xiet Fen for coming as well. And, um, what can I say? But well, thank you all. Thank you very much. Well, my father has passed, but his legacy lives on in me. And I see it as my duty to fulfill his legacy. And what I want to achieve to fulfill my father's legacy is this. I have told you how my father came from humble origins. When he came to Singapore, he had no family. When he graduated from Nanta University, his parents were not there to congratulate him. I want to make sure that every Singaporean has the chance to succeed the way my father did. And that means to me, the biggest battle is to be fought in the field of equality. We cannot have a society which is as unequal as we are at the moment. And over the last few days, I have been enraptured, as many of you have been, with the debate going on in Parliament about the humongous salaries of mayors. And I think that is wrong. I think it is wrong to pay someone so handsomely for so little work done, and to pay them repeatedly for various jobs that they hold simultaneously because I want to improve the lot of the working class and of the lower income group so that their children will rise to the very top like what my father did. Thank you very much.
That is my mission.